And the thing that really bothered me is not what most non-Muslims are saying. We're very used to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did say in the Quran, وَلَا تَسْمَعُنَّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ وَالَّذِينَ أَشْرَقُوا مِنْهُمْ أَذَنْ كَثِيرًا O companions, that's a thousand four hundred years ago, Allah told them, you are going to hear many, many, many words and many statements from those of the Jews and Christians, so because they live around you and they live among you, and from those who make partners with Allah, so all other beliefs. You're going to hear from them many words that are going to hurt you about your beliefs. Allah says, stand firm, don't worry about that. Everyone has an opinion. They're entitled to it, they can say whatever they want. However, what bothers me the most is when some of our own brothers and sisters, they get sucked in to those words. You know, it's like when you're at school, if you remember when you were in high school, secondary school, and you got bullied for being different, or because you were smart, or because the teacher noticed your intelligence. Some students who were jealous, they'll just say a lot of things. Had you listened to them, you wouldn't reach what you reached. Brothers and sisters, Words like this, inshallah, we all know and we're ready for that. They just don't know. So take the time. But when the, some of our sisters and some of our brothers, they get affected by those words, something as simple as this, when, when you hear someone say, or especially if it was a friend that you like and trust that they were not Muslim, they say to you, hijab is backwards. That word backwards seems to trigger a lot of us. Why should it trigger us? Ask the question, what makes the hijab what makes you say that hijab is backwards? What is it about a piece of cloth that a woman wears around her body to conceal herself from head to toe? What makes that make her backwards? What is it exactly about cotton that was made out of a plant from the earth that she just wore a little bit more of it makes her backwards? In what way? Like in what way? If we're going to listen to them, then we make ourselves backwards. Once I remember at Mercy Hospital, when I had my uh, second daughter, went into the elevator, and inside I see a surgeon, a top heart surgeon, that is highly respected. He was a Jew. How did I know he was a Jew? He's got the whole gear on, man, from top to bottom. This is the stuff you see only, you know, in Palestine, in so-called Israel, over there. You know those people who stand next to the wall and they hold something and they start moving back and forth on the wall with the big dreadlocks at the sides and all that? Exactly like that. He doesn't sit there listening to people who have addresses. Even though we believe that they have heard, they've gone off the straight path. Yet you've got respect. At the end of the day, let them say what they want to say. In our history, that is full of rich history of many, many, many women with full hijab who have achieved what many, 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 many of non-Muslim women have never. In fact, they looked up to them for 1,300 years. One woman by the name of Fatima Fahili, for example, in the 11th century, or just before that, sorry, in the 8th century, she is the first one that established a psychiatric ward. There was no psychiatric wards before that. Hijab from top to bottom. And then stop it. The first one also, same woman, to establish a university. There were no universities before that, where you brought in all the disciplines and all the different courses and subjects to learn in one big institute. That was a woman. Midwifery by her as well. And it, our history from there is rich of so many sisters and women where Hijab played no role in keeping them backwards. Till today, under that in the modern world, just that they don't make it too much in the media or we don't read about it. You know, we have Nobel Prize winners in hijab from top to bottom. It did not stop them. Top surgeons, top, top um, engineers even, in, in every shape and form. Hijab itself does not put a person back. It's the mindset. And if you listen to what these people say, if you let it be something that puts you back, but if you really do think about it, what is it about it that keeps you back? Where, even for a Muslim, where you wear your beard, you want to wear your beard out of worship, what keeps you back? What's about that? You want to change your skin color and your name and your identity and everything because 
there's going to be people not even happy with your name. If you have self-respect and people see you stand up for with integrity to what you believe in strongly and the community helps each other and supports one another and we as Muslim men, we look up to our sisters too and we let them feel that they are important and that we cannot do without them. Because as the Prophet said, and Nisa wa Shaqa Rijal. Women are the peers of men. Do you know what peers means? Peers means they are equal to men. They're not equal in their roles. They're equal to the men in their purpose, in their identity, in their if they are Muslim, they're, they're the same. Our sisters are our peers. We complement each other. They have strengths and weaknesses, and we have strengths and weaknesses, we complement each other like a jigsaw. That's what the Prophet said, and he said, I should call a rijal. And he said amongst his last words before he died, so I said, I request you, O men, to treat your women with goodness. And I speak to my sisters as well, that you do not need the Western influence, this liberalist, modernist, so-called progressive, secularist ideologies today. These are all just names they make up. Do you not see the rate of depression rising? Do you not see the rate of anxiety rising? Do you not see the rate of fakeness rising? People just throwing all sorts of opinions and morals as they wish. You understand that, nobody, that, and nobody, no science. I have a science background, and I've never studied in science for all my life. That science deals with morals and ethics. Yeah, science does talk about ethics. This is ethically right, it's ethically right. But science itself, the process of science, does not test ethics and morals. They leave it up to the society and people. And people, they have all sorts of thoughts. This is right, this is wrong. I remember 10 years back, the beard was... A, and, and the people... And if you had a beard, you were called a terrorist, an extremist or a fundamentalist. Now the beard is in fashion, it looks cool, it looks attractive. Non-Muslim people have more beards than us. Do you see how the wind changes all of a sudden? Are we going to follow the wind as it takes us? We're going to stand firm. The hijab is only given empowerment to women. Yes, people say a lot of rubbish, but that's up to you. If you want to respect that, respect your faith. I hear, I see sisters who don't wear the hijab at all. But then when they talk about the hijab, they talk in its defense and fierceness. Why? Because they have the know we have our deed and our Islam. We know that this is something that gives us our true identity and power. The Quran doesn't say hijab. Anyway, the Quran, you don't, you don't look at it. Some people, some Muslims even, recently one sister said, what, what? She wrote to me saying, I have a friend who something's gone wrong. She, she's taken off her hijab and she says, there's no way in the Quran that says you've got to wear hijab. And this is a sign of the lack of understanding of Quran. What is it? The Quran does not say hijab because the garment, the, the covering that our sisters wear, is not called hijab. It was never called hijab. In the time the Prophet it wasn't called hijab. It was just called a clothing, a woman's clothing. It was called a sitter. A sitter means a screen. And all people, all women, always wore lots of clothing. The only difference is that when the Quran came down, the Quran said to the women, said to the Prophet to tell the women and for us to remind our sisters and to explain to them that Allah has said, so Allah said, Allah said to the Prophet tell the believing women and your, tell your wives and the believing women, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women, so let's go start with family first, to draw their garments, their outer garments, their, their jaladin, and there's a word khimar, over the opening around their necks. That's called a jade. A jade is then when you wear something, a v-neck or any kind of whatever, that, that there is called a jade, it's like a pocket. He said to them, just draw yours and cover your entire necks in front because the women weren't doing that. Not Muslim women, all women. So it, it's a funny thing. In fact, hijab is just a modern word. We use it, we know what it means, but it's not the correct definition. Hijab just means to, to, to cover. 
So if a person's wearing shorts, you are covering. That's called a hijab too. Hands is hijab, meaning you are covering, you're covering, covering your legs. You wear a shirt, you're covering your, your torso. You know, you're wearing long sleeve, you're covering your arms. It's a cover. But sitter is a screen. What do you install? What do you put a screen on? Allah says, everything except for the face and the hands. That's according to the hadith. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about that. Maybe one day, inshallah, we'll talk about the futah aspect of it. But like our brothers and sisters, we have each other, alhamdulillah. And Allah already told us, you're going to hear words that hurt you. And just always remember, there have been people who wanted to kill Islam, kill the Muslims, break it, find anything wrong with them, and then later on, they themselves convert to Islam. Use them as your inspiration. Many of our sisters, we've got many celebrities, many singers, who now converted or now wear the hijab. I remember one brother, Abhiya, told me about it. She's an Indian um, actress, very, very famous, very beautiful, very all that stuff that people talk about, her attractiveness and whatever. And in the end, she's a Muslim. And then she put on the hijab. And the, 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 the interviewer asked her, why did you do it? What made you do it now? She said, I watched a, a funeral. And I didn't want the first day that I wear my hijab is the day when they're washing me to bury me. Because when you wash uh, women in the janazah, in the burial, the, the, the funeral, we cover their head. And she said, wow, I don't want that first day to cover my head. It's the day when I have to go into my grave. And I'm going to do it beforehand. Hijab is an act of worship, divine, from Allah, not from men. We did not say to women, cover up. This is not a man's thing. In fact, I can argue there, there are all sorts of feminists. Feminism is, has many different streams. It's not one type of feminist. And originally it had good intentions from the Western view. But as time went on, I can argue that men themselves liked the idea of feminism in the beginning because they needed women to go out and work in a workplace and to pay them less and so on and so forth after the World War um, after World War One and World War Two. So what I'm saying is, Allah is the one who sent down the commands. Had He said to the men, cover your hair, we would cover our hair. Had Allah said to us, cover your face, the men, we would say, yes, O oh Lord, we can obey your command. Had He said, don't, don't, well, don't cover your hair, we will tell our sister, don't cover your hair. We do not make the rules, Allah is the one. And if you love Allah, and you obey Allah, and you trust in Allah, and you know that you came from Him and going to return to Him, you make that decision. Based on your faith and beliefs, don't let the people around you. They are a test to you. They are a test. All these people around us, when says they are a test of our faith, Allah says in the Quran, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ وَأَيُّتْرَكُ وَأَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا Do humans assume that they will be left alone just to merely say with their mouths, we believe, without being tried and tested from their belief, you're going to be put to the test as evidence of what you are claiming. Men and women, this is our belief in how to do that. And we have thousands, over a thousand years of evidence to prove our glory in how It's just been about a hundred years. And we are the only religion, alhamdulillah, in the world who in such a large number still adhere strongly to the traditions, to the, to the original teachings of our religion. Have you thought about that? And why? Why is it bad? What, what, what do they want from us? Why pick on our women? We see lots of women being persecuted around the world. Talk about them. Now that the issue of the hijab came up, or they should have a choice. This is a Western ideology. This is called bullying, manipulation. Let them say what they want to say. We're not following Iran. We're not following Iraq. We're not following Saudi. We're not following, following, following anybody. We are following Quran and Sunnah. We don't have a country that we follow. We don't have a people that we follow. We follow a lion's messenger. And that's for the end of time. We are unique. Impeccable in our religion is now. Look at us. There is nobody that he is taught as much as the Muslims. And I think this is what they envy you for. All out of ignorance. Do you know of a place in the world where Millions of people, men and women, 
every single minute. Listen carefully. Every single minute. Not hour, minute. Except for the five daily prayers. Night and day. For 1,300 years. With a few gaps here and there. In Mecca. In Mecca. In the Haram. Sanctuary. Kaaba. Around the Kaaba. There are two hills called Safa and Marwa. People continue to walk between them exactly seven times. Why? Because of one single woman. Her name is Hajar. Who existed nearly 5,000 years ago. The wife of Abraham. We are practicing exactly her footsteps between these two hills. Who honors women the way he said that? The problem, the problem is that some of us, because of our little bit of ignorance religion or shakiness, their little words, like bullies in a classroom and call the intelligent kids nerds, like them. It's full of names because I don't know what else to call them. But their vocabulary is not good enough. When we let their words get to us, we start to interpret our practices as bad as ourselves. Well, what do you think about it? I think, well, what's the big deal about a, few, a bit of clothing? Why is it a big deal to you? Why do you hate it so much? Why can't a woman still speak and be intelligent, educated, and come into, um, be an influence, do, it, you know, do great things, while she still wears her hijab? What's, what's the problem with that? What is the problem with that? This is the question. What is the problem? Nothing. So my brothers and sisters, stick to it. Life is short. And Allah says many things. I'm going to have to talk about it before. In Surah Al-Munafiqun. It's called the, the Surah of the Hypocrites. Lots of people are hypocrites today. Allah says, On the Day of Judgment, those who believe will be reclining on high towers and beautiful couches in paradise. They will be laughing at those who used to laugh at them in this world. Have to talk about it before. Allah says, What do you think of such an end? Have I not made, made it up to you as a result of what these Islam hating people said, used to say and do? Or say, I don't know, maybe I'm quite a bit young, young, young woman. But it will soon come to know. May Allah guide them. May Allah guide them. We don't even sit in a room, in a classroom where you're doing so good. And because of a few other students who, who just can't do as good as you, you don't let them get to you and you stop your, your, your achievements. Continue. That's the integrity. Don't let people tell you what to do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen our woman. Bless you all and bless your hearts. I just thought I'd give a little short one. I mean, this, I, I need a whole lecture on this. I'd like to take it, you know, step by step. I've got so much good to tell you. Some, some tools that you can take with you. And so that whenever you see or hear people like that, you know exactly how to think and even how to respond. Anyway, inshallah ta'ala, just stick to the truth, my dear and sisters, and you will be triumphant. Have self-respect, you will force people to respect you, even if they hate it. Because people respect people who stick to a value and they're so sure of it. They say, how are you so sure? It's amazing how you just, you know what you're doing. Because many people don't know. It's following, following, like sheep, whatever. They go this way, we'll go this way, go that way, we'll go that way. Influencers tell them this and they just bring the views. We have those hijabi influences. If you've heard of them, they go on, get, they get all these views, they make our these sisters who wear the hijab feel like they're, they've got someone who stands up for them and really understands them. And before you know it, many of them took it off because the money started coming in. And big businesses offered them even greater things. They took it off and they changed their tone. All my life I've been, you know, struggling with it anyway. I just didn't tell you. And you know, I'm just being me, you being you. You know, these statements, they're lying to you. She used you to make money. And now she's big. She's got bigger people. She's got bigger, bigger support. Maybe not all of them. But at least it, it is a betrayal. It is a betrayal. Influences can betray you in time. Brothers and sisters, be unique. Be independent and be powerful. Stick to your own beliefs. You don't need people to tell you what to do. May Allah lost my past strength in more. Brothers and sisters, we have about half an hour maximum. So, let us go back to the great heroes. The heroes, the real people who were cool. They were amazing. 
They were triumphant. They were the role models. Even though they're not with us today, we still have every aspect about their life. We know how they smiled. We know how they walked. We know how they ate. If one of them spat on the floor, we know they spat. We know how many of them. Because only the best of people you know their entire history. The ins and outs. I think this is a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not know of any history, of any individual in history that has so much detail about their lives like our Prophet Muhammad is to one and his companions that were around him. Be glorified with that. Let us look at this great man, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. I've already talked about his childhood. I've talked about as he grew up. I've talked about how he became Muslim. talked about his characteristics. talked about who he, are, who he is. I've talked about what Khalifa means, how long Islam ruled in the world for over 1,300 years, how far it reached. We talked about what makes a Khalifa, a Caliph, what does it mean, how is he elected, why, and so on. And last week we talked about what we're going his relationship with the Prophet Sallallahu And up to here we now understood that he was the best friend of the Prophet peace be upon him in this life. There was no one closer to the Prophet peace be upon him, right, outside of his family than Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And I say his family because the believing family who has blood, but he also had family who were disbelievers. In fact, some of them were enemies like Abu Lahab. But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was the closest friend of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So let us learn from the man who walked and talked and was raised with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in every aspect of the way. He loved him more than himself. So last week we spoke about how the famous story of him and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were migrating from Mecca to Medina. They were leaving their home and going to Medina so that Islam could be established and was going to be, to be spread in the world. But there were enemies running after them. And there was, a, there was this leader named Abu Jahl. He went out and grabbed the leaders of Mecca and they made... Um, they, 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 um, what's the word for it when you write a notice? And, uh, they had a bounty on his head. They had a bounty on the Prophet sallallahu said that whoever is with him. And they offered, I think it was a thousand camels for whoever can bring him dead or alive. Because they knew he had escaped. Because they wanted to assassinate him. And there was a man named Surata ibn Malik. Surata was still a non Muslim. He converted to Islam later on. This man was one of the most fierce warriors. He never fell off his horse. He goes out to try and find Muhammad and his companion. We'll come back to him very shortly. When the Prophet was in a cave of Thal, do you remember the cave of Thal, the story of Thal, where they hid in there, and the cobweb and all that story we talked about last time? So the enemies came and they couldn't see them, so they ran off. They went to look somewhere else. At that point, the Prophet, peace be upon him, Abu Bakr, he said to him, Ya Abu Bakr, what are you, what's wrong? Because Abu Bakr was shaking, he said, Thanks for Allah, Abu Jahan was standing right above him. If he just looked down with his eyes, he would have looked and seen my eyes, and they would have killed us. The Prophet laughed. He said, Ya yeah, Abu Bakr, ma ba'u ba bithnaini, Allahu thalithuhma. Abu Bakr, what do you think when I tell you there are two people in the cave and Allah is their third? Allah inna Allah ma'ana ya Abu Bakr. Allah is with us. Allah is always with you. Stand by that. But you have to plan as well. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam planned. He didn't just sit there and say, Allah is with me, no one's going to get me. If he is the messenger of God, and Allah is protecting him, yet he still had to make strategies, he still had to plan. He was going out in so much secrecy. And in fact, he was supposed to go this way, instead he went that way. Why? So that he can make the, the people who are after him, so they can be lost. You know, it looks like he went the other way, he's not gone to Medina, he's supposed to go to Medina. So they went looking for him that way in Medina, and he took the other route, he went the other way. So he's planning and doing strategies. A Muslim doesn't sit there like a guinea pig. You make strategies, you plan to, the, to every resources that you have. Then they got out of the cave and they went in the direction of Medina and Islam. On their way, they got very hungry and very thirsty. There was a woman, a very old woman, who was known. She had a little house and a tent that was on the way in the distance. That was an Arab custom there. 
She dedicated her and her husband their life to be there. They had some goats and sheep. And any travelers that went past in the desert, they used to offer them food, drink, and if they wanted to sleep for a night or two or three. This was a custom of the Arabs. So the Prophet ﷺ arrived. She had never seen him before, only heard about him. And the Prophet was with his friend Abu Bakr, and with them was um, a servant and a guide. This woman, her name was Umm Ma'bad, very old woman, Umm Ma'bad. Her husband was away with his goats, and, she, and the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr, they knew who she was, and they heard about her. So he said to her, Ya Umm Ma'bad, O oh, Umm Ma'bad, do you have some food for us? And she said, come, yes, yes, I've got some food, but only a little bit. When they went, they found that she only had a little bit, not even enough for her, herself and her husband. So the Prophet saw a little sheep at the end of her house, and he said, what about that sheep over there? Has it got any you? It's a you, it's a female sheep. Does it have any milk in it? She said, it's old, it's no longer produces any milk. He said, bring it to me. He brought it and he did an act of miracle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously is the one who gave him the miracle. So he wiped over the back and underneath and he says a few words and subhanAllah he filled up with milk. So they filled the whole bucket and they drank all of them and then he filled another bucket up and kept it for him. And when her husband returned, he said, where did you get the milk from? And she said, who came? And then she gave what we have today the most clearest description of what the Prophet is who wanted to look like. This hadith about Mubabad, its chain is a little bit weak, but it has many other hadiths that support it, support this meaning. She said, Oh my husband, a man with his companions came and there was a blessing that he blessed our sheep by the will of God. He was a man with obvious beauty and cleanliness. Zahir al-Wadah, al He was, so he was traveling in the desert, but he, he didn't look dirty. But also, I said, no matter where he traveled, he always looked clean. She said, he was a man with obvious beauty and cleanliness. So I just translated her words. A glowing face. His facial expressions were always glowing when he looked at him. And a naturally good appearance in mind and character. With no bulging stomach disgracing him. <laughs> it's, not, it's not meant to disgrace anyone here, brothers. So, no bulging stomach disgracing him, meaning he, didn't, he wasn't a big ear and stuff. Um, or a small head belittling him. These are her words is obviously and openly handsome. As soon as you look at him, anyone looks at him and says, what a handsome man. And she said, and wholly beautiful. Anywhere you looked at him, it was beautiful to look at. His eyes are wide, wide eyes, and very white and black. The, the iris of his eye was very black, and the white around it was very white. No blemishes, no veins, nothing. Very, very clear, as if you drew, you drew as if he coloured them with paint, with white paint and black. And the eyelashes were long, whose voice is devoid of hoarseness. So no, it's not raspy, it's not scratchy, but clear and pleasant to the ear. His neck was long, he had a long neck, a strong long neck. And his beard was full, the white part of whose eyes is extremely white and the black part of whose eyes is extremely black, as if his eyelids have cushion naturally. Eyeliner. You know the eyeliner? So he had natural eyeliner around his eyes. Uh, he didn't put it on, it was natural, he was born that way. Who is dignified when silent and is gorgeous when speaking, who is the most beautiful and striking man for, from far, and the best and most beautiful from close, whose speech is sweet, clear, and decisive. When he spoke, he spoke in order and he was organized. His speech was neither vaguely short nor boringly and pointlessly long, whose words flowed forth like a perfect string of pearls, as I said before, order and organized, of medium height. His height is neither short in a way that makes a person dismiss him, nor too tall that makes a person intimidated, who is a branch between two branches, meaning he sticks out. He, 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 so if you have three branches 
and the one in between looks so... So if, if you've got three people walking, he stands out, in other words. He is the most radiant of the three and the most well-respected, whose companions surround him. When he speaks, they listen attentively to his speech. And when he commands, um, when he commands, they go to him and they listen to him and they fulfill his command without any hesitation. Who is well served and attended, who is neither a scowler, la uh, alabis. Scowler is someone who has a frown between his eyebrows. Have you seen these types of people? They've always got a frown. You know, it's always like they've got a chip on their shoulder. Every time I look at someone, you think that they're looking into your soul and want to kill you. He has a chip. It wasn't like that. He was, when you looked at him, he was very welcoming. Um, nor a prattler. A prattler. Uh, when a family meaning a blabbermouth. It wasn't a blabbermouth, a chatterbox, he didn't talk too much. These are the words of the Prophet among many other beautiful descriptions. So they left. On their way, do you remember that man Salah al Malik? The man, the great warrior, never fell off his horse. Now that guy, yeah, he was a great horse rider, he was really good at war and everything, but he couldn't read and write, he wasn't really educated. And he was very simple in his mind. So he's galloping towards, he sees Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he sees Abu Bakr and his friends. He was very good at deserts and he can follow footsteps. When he found them, he began to gallop towards them. He says, yes, the camels, the bounty. Abu Bakr anhu was standing there next to the Prophet, a fair distance away. He hears the galloping and looks behind him, Abu Bakr. And he sees Surat ibn Malik, he recognizes him. And he knows that Surat ibn Malik, you can't escape him, man. He will get you, he'll keep following until he gets you. And he started getting scared, Abu Bakr. So what did he do? He started walking behind the Prophet, behind him, all the time. Why? So that if the guy gets to him, he'll get to Abu Bakr first. And he would say to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, he's almost about to reach us. And the Prophet ﷺ is walking so normally. He's not running, he's not jogging. And he's very calm. And he's making thicker. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, things like that. And Abu Bakr was getting really anxious. The guy was almost going to get to them. As soon as he got really close, Abu Bakr was getting ready to defend the Prophet ﷺ. When suddenly the horse tripped and Suraka fell forward. Suraka looks up and he goes, What? I have never fallen off my horse. So he said some swear words, get back on his horse and gallops again, the horse fell again. By the second or third time, we remember I told you Suraka was simple minded, and really he was right. At this point he was actually correct. He got up and he said, This is a bad omen. This man must be something special. I'm scared. Surata became scared. He's got the weapons. He's got the horse. He's the one. He's the, uh, the bounty hunter. And he falls off and he looked at it as a bad omen. He rushes to the Prophet ﷺ, sits on his knees and begs him to let him go. Surata is begging the Prophet to let him go. So the Prophet looks back at him and he says, Ya Surata, as he's smiling. And Abu Bakr is looking with his open mouth, thinking, this is amazing, what has just happened here? Rasul Sallallahu looks at him and says, Ya Surah we will let you go. But I want to tell you something. O Surah the day, if I would live, if I could live to the day when I see the bangles of Kisra, Kisra, Khosro, the Emperor of Persia. In those days, the Emperor of Persia was like, and Persia was a superpower. It was a superpower of the world. Nobody could beat Persia. O Suraka, if I would live to the day when I see the battles of Khosro, the Emperor of Persia, in your own wrists. It means the Muslims are going to conquer Persia and they're going to take their jewelry. And Suraka will be among them, among the Muslims, and he will wear the bangles of the emperor. Suraka says, really? Now Suraka believes everything Muhammad says. 
Because can you give me a letter to say that you freed me? Meaning if the day comes and any Muslim leader, if it's not you, I get afraid they might remember this day that tried to um, execute me because I tried to kill you. Can you write me a letter or something to say that guarantees my security in the future if I'm going to live till then? And he told Abu Qadda not to write something and he sealed it. Surah so al lived on and became a Muslim until the day when Umar ibn al-Khattab became the Khalifa. So we're talking from there nearly, what, more than 20 years later. And truly they conquered Persia and Umar ibn al-Khattab was the Khalifa. And they brought all the treasures of Persia. And then he said, where is Suraqa? Umar, the Khalifa. He says, where is Suraqa? Suraqa says, here I am. He says, here are the bangles of Khosra. Where then? As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. So he put him on him and he walked around. Look at me. He showed off. Now this is a time when you're allowed to show off. Why? Not because of the bangles. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promised him. Then after that, Muhammad said, take them off now. Because what do you mean the Prophet promised you? Because the Prophet didn't say you're going to keep them. He said you will wear them. Take them off. They go to the Muslims. <laughs> and he took them off. That was it. That was the story of Surah al ibn Malik al And their way, so they reached in the end, they reached Medina. And we all know the welcoming that they did for the Prophet and Abu Bakr in Medina. In Medina, there were two types of people. They were called the Muhajireen and the Ansar. The Muhajireen are all the Muslims in the early, early stages of Islam. They're the ones who supported the Prophet, who suffered, who got beaten up, who were persecuted. Some of them were killed, their parents were killed, some of their own family tortured them. They're the ones who stood by the Prophet in the first, early years of Islam. These Muhajireen, they are the best of all creation after the Prophets. Remember that. What are they called? Muhammad, Jireen, and they are mentioned in the Quran. And the second people are called the Ansar. Muhajireen and the Ansar. Ansar, the victors, the ones who can get victory to the Prophet. These two people, my dear brothers and sisters, forget about any, any top shot, gun shot heroes that you've never heard of in your entire life. These are the heroes of all heroes. Wallahi, these particular people, the Muhajirun and the Ansar. If you can go back to the history books, brothers and sisters, learn as many of their names. Those are the real more wrong models, not those half up twisty influences that some of, some of our youngsters are looking for. I'm not going to say the names in here. They don't deserve it. These are the men and the women whom Allah spoke in the Quran about and said, Rijalun they were true men who stuck to the promise that they promised Allah. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُ Some of them died. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرُ Some of them stayed at that time. وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا They never went off the path even a tiny inch. They were so firm and strong. These people, when you men hear their, their stories, brothers and sisters, Wallahi, this is what kept me, when I was a child, my father used to tell me the companion stories and I just wanted to go back in time. Whenever I went to, went to secondary school, seven year old, I got bullied big time, man. I got bullied because I prayed. I got bullied because I didn't want a girlfriend. Well, not just because of that. And I got bullied, I got bullied for three things, actually four things. Got bullied because I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't want one. I got bullied because, well that really includes touching a girl or kissing a girl or shaking hands, I didn't do any of that stuff, alhamdulillah. Number two, I prayed, they go, what the hell is this guy doing? Praying. And number three, um, I didn't swear. Why does he swear? It's not cool. And number four, I couldn't afford the paradise. In those days, paradise just came out, you had to have three stripes. You know the three stripes? One time there was four stripes, a special edition. So I've got the three stripes. If you can be a rebel and not wear the school uniform and come to school with Adidas, you are the coolest, the coolest hero in the entire school for the rest of the year. Until the new fashion comes out. Three stripes. My dad used to take me, we used to be called Fortress, you know, give me to You know more of that. Or came up. I said, Dad, get me Adidas. 
He says, you know, this is an Adidas. I get it's got two stripes. <laughs> one day he gets me an Adidas, he says, Adidas. <laughs> Fake one. Went to school with her, I became even a bigger loser with because I didn't wear Adidas. But this is what they looked at. Do you see how superficial it is? Is this how it is? Got clothing, you got to have three stripes. Can't have two, can't have one, you have to have three. One day I got sick having an operation on my ear. My uncle, he buys Keith Brands. Gets me a little present after an operation. I open up, what is it? A whole suit of Adidas and had the three stripes. It was a cheaper brand, but it's three stripes. That's the important thing. Went to school one day with my three stripes, man. Yeah, I was cool for that day. A lot stood up in the canteen. I felt like I took over the whole school. I got three stripes. See this kid standing there from year nine. I'm in year seven. He's in year nine. I got jealous. He says, I've got one of those. I go, okay. He says, I've got two kids. I said, all right. Because I can afford more than that. See, I found it so weird. Even till today, this materialism still gets to our heads. You're cool because you have three. You know, it was so cool that some, some people used to go out of their way to steal out of those hands from shops just for the sake of reputation. Do you know what I'm talking about, brothers and sisters? This is what is happening now these days. Don't listen to them. It's rubbish. So anyway, brothers and sisters, what was I up to? Oh, these companions, they're amazing. These are the gods. I used to think about them and say, the companions used to cop worse. Well, Allah, here I'm on the truth. Every time they tease me, every time I held on more, because I knew I'm on the truth. Because Allah told me, the more they tease you for being on the truth, that's a sign that you are on the truth. And I just kept going, man. MashaAllah. I have lots of stories. Got into year eight. I had a brother who was Muslim, became religious, alhamdulillah. One person converted to Islam for two weeks. And left it. There are lots of these stories, right? By the end of the year, those who bullied me, well, lying, they ended up respecting me. And now today, they're like 45, whatever, and they've got kids. You know, we went out last time. I said, hey, no alcohol. Is it still the same? It's exactly the same. Even worse. No alcohol. SubhanAllah. So, brothers and sisters, stick to your identity and watch. Even the people who don't like you, they still respect you. Stick be having integrity. My brothers and sisters, these companions, Muhajirun and Ansar, are the best of all creation. Allah says in the Quran, Allah says in the Quran, رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Him. Nobody in the entire Quran had this status where Allah says, has sealed in the Quran His pleasure upon them. They were the Muhajirun and the Ansar. Remember that. People of Medina, people of Mecca, and people of Islam. They welcomed men and women. They welcomed the Prophet Sallallahu In the beginning, they didn't know who it was. They didn't know if he was, which one was the Prophet, which was Abu Bakr. Because they had never seen him. Then when they saw Abu Bakr get his cloak and shield the Prophet from the sun, they knew who was the Prophet. They also knew the special status of Abu Bakr had with the Prophet. Hey guys, you know, I'm just let me tell you, he was skinny and he, was, he, he wasn't too tall. He wasn't very strong physically. But man, no one would mess with him. He'd be the first in the battlefield. And when they saw him, they ran away from him. Strength is not how big the biceps are. Strength starts in here. It starts with your faith and belief. So brothers and sisters, they entered, and you know the famous story of Tala and Badr Alayna min Thaniya Din Wada, you know that, 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 that song? I know you want to hear it. I'm not going to sing for you. I don't know if the entire Tala and Badr is real, but it seems real. And it sounds nice. And what the heck? It's not going to harm us if we believe in it, no problem. Tala and Badr Alayna, the moon has shined upon us. Min Thaniya Din Wada. From the uh, from the, the valleys of Wada and so on and so forth, it has become incumbent upon us to be grateful and thank Him and welcome Him. Everybody rejoiced. They were singing. They were um, celebrating the coming of the Prophet Sallallahu the Messenger of God. Abu Bakr radiallahu was with him, and then they started living their lives in Medina. So we're talking about Abu Bakr. 
another against the Prophet so let me get off on that and I'll, I'll get um, off the topic on that inshallah so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had certain incidents in Medina I'll just finish off with these few incidents they're interesting the first incident that happened in Medina between Abu Bakr and others just to show you some character he was once sitting in the masjid with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This hadith is in what we call Musnad Ahmad and Sunan Abu Dawood and others. So it's an authentic hadith. But one of them was sitting in the masjid and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was there as well. A man entered the masjid and started to say harsh words, abusive words to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu stayed quiet. He didn't say the same words back to him because he's not like him. He was silent while the Prophet was just sitting there, waiting for the man to finish. Suddenly Abu Bakr anhu couldn't handle it and decides to reply something to the man. He said something hurtful to the man. Abu Bakr had the right, but he said one little word. Suddenly Rasul got up and he left the masjid. And Abu Bakr chased after him. Ya Rasulullah. Why did you leave? He said, so long as that man was abusing me in the masjid, and he was safe, but he was just abusing him, I could see an angel behind you replying back to him on your behalf. The moment you took it upon yourself to take your right, the shaitan came in and the angel went. And I did not sit in a masjid, in a masjid where the shaitan is. Because the shaitan loves to fill the flames up. It is your right. If somebody says an F word to you, you want to say F word back. You're not going to get sins for that unless you feel more. But a Muslim doesn't do that. I know some of you might think, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Because now I've got all the youngsters, it seems like a green light. If not already, they say it a thousand times. I stuffed up, didn't I? I stuffed up. But what I'm saying is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallah, Allah says, exercise hardening, exercise patience and, and rise. Do you want to be like everyone else or do you want to rise? You want to rise above that. Take control of yourself. So what did the line reply, man? You can see the shaitan comes in. As soon as you take your right back in the same way the shaitan wants to, make it worse. That's what happens. So avoid. Rasul Sallallahu was not a coward. But he used to say this. Do not wish to meet the enemy. Do not ever wish to meet the enemy. That's how I can't wait to see that I'm going to bash him and clobber him and put him to the ground and step on him. No. Rasul said, do not wish to meet the enemy, but if the enemy comes in your face and you have no option, then be a lion. But don't wish, a Muslim doesn't go to look for trouble. We get out of trouble. My brothers and sisters, another incident I want to mention to you. There was a dispute between Abu Bakr and a man in Medina by the name of Rabia ibn Ka'ab al Mastami. Now remember, they're all new to Medina now, and so little altercations happen here and there. The hadith is in Mustadrak al hakim Sahih, by condition of Muslim, for those of you who want um, sources. They had a dispute over a land that the Prophet ﷺ had given each one of them. The Prophet gave one to this one, it was as a result of a, of a battle which had, which was when the Muslims were victorious. And he gave a land to Abu Bakr and a land to the other guy. So, Abu Bakr and him, they had a dispute over a palm tree that was right in the middle. He said, no, the Prophet said it's mine. He said, no, the Prophet said it's mine. Now remember, as the Prophet said it, each one feels there's a blessing in that. So Abu Bakr Allah says, it's mine. And he says, no, it's mine. So Abu Bakr Allah said something, not very bad, but just something that was a little bit hurtful. And the other man got, he went quiet. When Abu Bakr Allah realized what he had said, he grabbed hold of the man and said, please, Say the same word back to me. Say the same word back to me. I don't want it on the day of judgment where you hold this against me. Take your right, please. Say it to me. And the man refused to reply back to Abu Bakr. said, I will not say it to you. Especially you, Abu Bakr. He knew the status of Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr said, if you don't say to me, hurt me the same way I hurt you, I'm going to go and complain to the Prophet about you. <laughs> he goes, go. And he went. On his way, the man, he, 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 he went after Abu Bakr just to see what was going to go on. And then some people came to this man and started trying to make fitna. Now these people, they're not really the best. They're just side people and said, look at this guy. He goes to complain to the Prophet about you. 
when he's the one who hurt you, it's as if like he's in the right. How can you do that? What nerve? And then he said to them, Don't you dare speak words about the Look at him. Do you know who that man is? He is the friend of the Prophet, the one who was with him in the cave, the one whom Allah mentioned in the, in the Quran. I fear that if I say something, if I listen to you, and then I say something to Abu Bakr, the Prophet will be displeased with me, which will make Allah displeased with me, and then I am doomed. Leave Abu Bakr alone. I accept. So when he got to the Prophet, he found the Prophet looking at the man, and the man said, Ya Rasul, he said, he said to, to the man, Did you really, is this true? Abu Bakr said something hurtful to you, and you refused to say it back? Take your revenge? He said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Good. Please don't say anything to my friend. Instead, say, May Allah forgive you, Abu Bakr. That's what we say, boys. Brothers and sisters in the masjid, is what we say. And in any way, our Muslim brothers, they heard you say, May Allah forgive you. May Allah forgive you. Abu Bakr then started to cry. He cried, he just got overwhelmed with emotion. With that statement, May Allah forgive you. And someone said, Love each other. Do we love each other? Like that. At least we have role models who can show us the standard. At least we can never be like them. I wish I was a hair on his chest, but we all know My name is Bilal, and I'm named after Bilal the Ethiopian. I wish I was a hair on his chest. These people were something amazing beyond. And I'll finish it with this that there came a time, there came a time in the Roman world where most of the companions had died out. This is approximately in the 5th or 6th Pilaf. And there's probably a few companions left. And I'll just say very quickly, the Byzantines and the Romans had had battles with the Muslims so many times, I thought, how did these people come out of the desert and beat the superpower of the Persians and gave us and took back land from us? This is amazing. It, they, go, they were the companions. And it got to a point where the companions were like a, a legend. A legend that their emperors used to ask, if they captured any Muslims, they would ask, is he a companion? Is she a companion? And if they said no, they go, oh, no big deal, just another Muslim. If they said they were a companion, they would keep them and try to offer them to marry their daughters, share with them their kingdom, try to convert them, because they literally, well, like they believed, that something in their genes, in their genetics, was divine, was special. So that if they marry from their daughters, their children will come out warriors and heroes like them. There is a big story actually about one great companion, but we'll leave it to another time in Shadow At the time of Omar when we talk about his khilafah, there's a beautiful story about one of the companions there at the Roman. Last story for all of you before the Adam. It is an incident that happened between the Prophet, the, between uh, the Prophet وسلم, and his wife Aisha. Aisha radiallahu is whose daughter? Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is her dad. So Abu Bakr was the father-in-law of the Prophet وسلم, but he never, like he never called him son-in-law. He called him Rasulullah. One day Abu Bakr radiallahu came to visit him, and he accidentally heard from outside um, his wife and his daughter Aisha. Raising her voice slightly at the Prophet, basically, raising it a little bit. So he knows his daughter. So he knocks and asks permission to enter. The Rasul lets him enter. He entered, and this hadith is in Musnad Ahmad and authenticated by Shaykh al Albani and others. So it's an authentic hadith. He walks in and he goes straight to his daughter, straight to his daughter, and he says to her, Daughter of Umm Ruman. So he wouldn't address her by her name, which showed that she knew that he was displeased with what she was doing. He said, daughter of Umm Ruman, that was his, his wife's name, Umm Ruman, is the messenger of God, the one that you are raising your voice at. Realize what he said, didn't say to your husband. He said, is it the messenger of God that you are raising your voice at? He turned it into a religious thing. This is beyond our family. And at the same time, he's teaching how couples should not yell at each other. So she went quiet immediately, and the Prophet could see Abu Bakr getting very displeased and upset. So the Rasul goes and jumps in between them. And he moves Abu Bakr aside and he says, 
it's okay, I'll walk. As soon as he saw the prophet jump in between that rock and put his head down and walked out, he would not dare come in the way. So the Prophet وسلم, he looks, وسلم, looks back at his wife and jokingly says, Didn't you see? Did you see I saved you from your dad? The Prophet says, Didn't you see how I saved you from your dad? After a little while, so you see, the Sussan wasn't affected by what had happened with Aisha. She raised her voice a bit, but he was thinking it was okay. He's not going to make a big deal out of things. Then Abu Bakr comes back later and he calmed down. And he sees that the Prophet and Aisha are joking and laughing. So then Abu Bakr gets a little bit upset and he says, Ya Rasulullah, Ashrikani fi silmikuma, kama ashraktumani fi harmikuma. O Messenger of Allah, well, do I get to be invited to share in your peace treaty as you invited me into your disputes and war? But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and the Prophet and this relationship, and the relationship between Rasulullah and his wife is this relationship. And he knew how to settle it, and Aisha knew how to also diffuse the situation. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he will not accept for anyone to harm, even his daughter, harm the Messenger of God. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So my brothers and sisters, the Aisha has now come in. There's a lot more to talk about. Inshallah, next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about Abu Bakr, the Lahan, followed by a very tragic end. Well, a tragic to us as Muslims, but it was inevitable, the death of the Prophet sallallahu and the stance of Abu Bakr and the companions in that time. Then we'll talk about how he was elected as a Khalifa. And Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So, Jazakum Allah khairu wa kariyadu wa sallam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa sallam